be slides only uh, and it might get a bit heavy but uh, that's fine you should keep up right <laughs> so we are going to discuss the growth of structure okay, at long last this is what uh, the whole series of talks is supposed to have been about and just to remind you this is what we want to understand this is the answer in some sense but we want to understand the physics behind why this kind of answer is expected to be realistic. Okay, and just to remind you, this is an n-body simulation, starting with uh, Gaussian random initial conditions consistent with CMB data, and it produces very naturally a structure that looks like the cosmic web that we saw with the galaxies. Before I forget, I just wanted to say that I have been posting the slides and also some lecture notes uh, on the LSS channel. Right? Uh, many of you are maybe not there on that channel. And after this lecture, I will also post a couple of homework exercises related to this lecture, again on the LSS channel. So if you're interested, you can follow me there. Okay. So before we get started with the mathematics, I just wanted to remind you of something that you have seen a few times now in Marco's lectures. Uh, this is the interplay between different length scales and the Hubble radius. Uh, uh, as a function of time during different epochs of the universe. This is a cartoon picture, okay, and here is inflation, and I have completely ignored reheating, so inflation ends and radiation domination begins, and uh, you can figure out in this log-log plot why H inverse, okay, a constant is a constant, but then why these slopes are the way they look like here. So I can tell you that this is a slope of two, this is a slope of three halves, okay, so you can figure out why that is. Uh, this is the radiation dominated epoch, matter dominated epoch. And in the blue dashed lines are shown three different length scales, three different co moving length scales here plotted in physical units. Okay, so the evolution of the scale factor is shown as a line of slope one because on the horizontal axis I have log of A. So each of these lambdas grows proportionally to the scale factor, and that's why each of them is a, has a, is a line of slope one. And the amplitude of each line or the intercept of each line tells you which uh, length scale is longer. So obviously lambda 1 is the largest, lambda 3 is the smallest. And I've chosen them such that uh, they exit the Hubble radius at three different epochs and then they re-enter the Hubble radius at three interesting epochs. Okay, so particularly lambda 1 and lambda 3 as you can see, they exit, so lambda 1 exits first, it's the longest, you saw this already, the first longest ones exit first and therefore it enters the Hubble radius at late times last. It's obvious from here, right? And the interesting difference between lambda 1 and lambda 3 is that when they enter the Hubble radius, at the time of the entry of lambda 3, the universe is radiation dominated, and at the time of entry of lambda 1, the universe is matter dominated. And of course there's a continuum of scales, so there will also by continuity be a scale which enters exactly around the time where matter and radiation are equal in their energy densities, okay? So this will be interesting later because uh, it turns out that uh, depending on when a particular wavelength enters the Hubble radius during normal evolution plays an important role in deciding how the fluctuation amplitude at that wavelength evolves with time, okay? So during radiation domination, the universe is dominated by radiation pressure and this tends to damp the oscillations, uh, the, the growth of structure by a substantial amount, whereas during matter domination, something else happens, okay? And structure is allowed to grow. So this is something to keep in mind and which we will see as we go along. Okay, so let's get into some of the details now. I'll go a little bit slowly through all the equations. I realize that since I'm not writing on the board, it will become a little bit tougher for you to follow, okay? So feel free even over Zoom, uh, to raise your hands and slow me down if, uh, if, you're not going, if you're not following what's happening. So let's set up the situation. We'll assume that we start in the early universe, well before the last scattering epoch. Remember, I talked about the last scattering epoch already. This is when hydrogen, neutral hydrogen forms and the photons are released, and the CMB is formed. Okay, so we'll start at a time well before that epoch. And we'll assume that uh, this early universe is very well described in terms of its metric by an FLRW form with small perturbations. 
So what I mean is written down here, and I will also assume that there is no spatial curvature, just for simplicity, okay? And then if you introduce spatial curvature, it adds more complexity to the equations, so we will remove that for the time being. Uh, not for the time being, for the entire lecture. Uh, so what does a perturbed FLRW metric look like? Uh, we will only follow what are called scalar perturbations. I will not deal with tensor modes in this talk. So the scalar perturbations in a particular choice of gauge, let's not worry about which choice it is, can be written in this form. Okay, so I have defined what is called the conformal time, which you have used, I think, before, in which, uh, in which language the scale factor simply comes out of the entire uh, metric dependence on space and time. Okay, so the scale factor comes out as a conformal factor. If I didn't have any perturbations, the quantity inside the square brackets would just be the Minkowski metric. It would be minus d eta squared plus dx squared. Okay, and that's why conformal time is nice, because the scale factor is just uh, conformally related to Minkowski. Okay, so now I want perturbations because I want to describe inhomogeneities. So the way it has been done in this particular choice of gauge is to add a perturbative component here, a new function phi, which depends on both time as well as space. Okay, so it is no longer uh, homogeneous, it is inhomogeneous. Similarly, the coefficient of the spatial part is perturbed by a quantity psi. Okay, so the convention I have chosen is to put a plus sign here and a minus sign here. There's no re real reason for, for doing this. It just makes things a little bit easier as we go along. So phi and psi are two metric potentials that are perturbing the FLRW geometry. So this is on the metric side. So now I have a perturbed FLRW metric. And uh, for later use, uh, I will also use what is called the conformal Hubble parameter. So the Hubble parameter, remember, is d log a by dt, where t is cosmic time in the usual way of writing the FLRW metric, where I have a minus dt squared plus a squared dx squared. In terms of conformal time also, I can define a similar quantity. This is now d log a by d eta, and you can easily check that this conformal Hubble parameter, script h, is related to the usual Hubble parameter just by one power of a, okay? It's also easy to understand because H inverse is like a physical length scale. So a, co a co-moving length scale would be uh, H inverse divided by A, right? Because in order to go from a physical length scale to a co-moving length scale, I have to divide by an A. So script H inverse is like the co-moving Hubble radius. Okay, so a conformal or co-moving Hubble radius. So this is the conformal Hubble parameter. Its inverse is the co-moving Hubble radius. It doesn't matter if, uh, you know, it, its significance will become apparent as we go along. In terms of uh, this way of writing it, the Friedman equation can be written in a very simple form. This uh, H0 squared times the square bracket is the usual Friedman equation. Okay, it has a matter term, which goes like 1 over A cubed. It has a radiation term, which goes like 1 over A4. It has a lambda term, which is a constant. And then, uh, because I'm talking about script H here, I have uh, extra power of A, which gets squared, and then it sits here. Okay, so this is just the Friedman equation. Okay, so this is uh, just to remind you what the background geometry looked like and how we have perturbed it. Now we also have to perturb the matter sector. Okay, so for the matter sector, you have to now ask what are the components that you want to track. So if I just look at the Friedman equation, I have just written down omega m0 here. So this m stands for the total matter content in which there is dark matter as well as baryonic matter. If I'm only talking about the background metric, this is fine because I can treat the baryonic components uh, as essentially non-relativistic. Uh, and I can, uh, you know, I can say that their, uh, their relation is uh, just given by, you know, by, by adding to whatever the non-relativistic dark matter is doing. So I don't have to worry about uh, these separate terms here. But when I deal with fluctuations, I have to worry about the fact that baryons interact with photons. Okay, so I have to treat baryons and dark matter separately. And I also have to deal with perturbations in photons. So then there is a convention uh, that is nice to adopt, 
Uh, this is uh, the convention used in, for example, Dodelson's treatment of linear perturbations. This entire discussion follows what Dodelson has done. So you can look up uh, the, the relevant chapters there if you're finding this a little bit too fast-paced. So what one does for the photons is to first argue that, uh, think of the, the unperturbed FLRW geometry in which there is a radiation field. This radiation field is described in terms of a Bose-Einstein distribution function of the photon momenta, right? So if I ask what is the, what, uh, how are the momenta of these photons in the photon bath distributed, they follow the Bose-Einstein statistics or the Planck spectrum, if you want to think in terms of a spectrum. And if you again remember the Bose-Einstein distribution, this is characterized by a single number, which is the temperature of the distribution. And this temperature in the homogeneous universe is depending, it depends only on time. It does not depend on space. Now I want to describe uh, the radiation content of a perturbed universe. So I have to first of all allow inhomogeneities in the distribution function. Okay, I cannot have a distribution function which only depends on time. It has to depend on space. But there's another complexity because it's a distribution function in phase space the momentum dependence of the distribution function could also be complicated. So remember the Bose-Einstein distribution in terms of the momenta depends only on the magnitude of the momentum of the photon, right? Or on the energy of the photon. Because the factor that appears is e to the power p divided by t minus one in the denominator. So now if I am in a perturbed universe, uh, because gravity can affect not only the magnitude of uh, the momentum of photons, but it can also lens the photons. It can change the direction of photons. In a perturbed universe, I should allow for changes in the directions of photons. So in general, I should allow the distribution function to start depending on the direction of the photon momentum as well. So there is a nice trick with which you can uh, proceed which is to say that let's club all of this complicated dependence, which we don't know, into a single function, which simply changes the temperature of an otherwise Bose-Einstein distribution. Okay, so I don't know actually what the perturbation to the Bose-Einstein function should look like, but if I'm going to do a perturbative analysis, I might as well say that uh, let the new distribution function also be Bose-Einstein. The only change that its temperature is now no longer dependent only on time, but it also depends on position as well as photon momentum direction. Okay, so I will introduce a quantity theta, it's dimensionless, this is like delta t over t for in the CMB, uh, and it depends on all of these uh, quantities. And of course, how it evolves is the name of the game, you have to figure out what the equations governing this quantity are. All right. And uh, the background energy density in radiation, as before, it just scales with the background temperature to the power 4. Uh, therefore, it goes as 1 over 8 to the power 4. For, so this is the radiation part. Now let's talk about the two matter components. I said that baryons and dark matter have to be treated separately. And at this level, when we are just defining the perturbations, we can do something simple. We just say that we want to track the energy density and the kinematic structure of, uh, of these two fluids, the dark matter fluid and the baryonic fluid. So for the energy density, you take the background energy density, rho bar. Someone had asked me what is the relevance of rho bar. Now you can see it. There is a background component, rho bar, but the actual energy density denoted by rho will depend not only on time, but also on space through, again, a dimensionless perturbation, which I call delta. Okay, so this is delta for dark matter, and then I can do the, exactly the same thing for the baryons. And in general, delta B and delta dark matter need not be proportional to each other. They need not be equal to each other. Is there a question? Okay. In addition to the perturbation of the density of these two components, uh, maybe, uh, maybe that somebody may need to be muted on. Okay. So in addition to the energy density, I also have to allow the velocity structure of these two components to vary. Because uh, remember the way co-moving coordinates are set up is to say that, there are, that they are the geodesics of fundamental observers in a homogeneous and isotropic universe. 
But now, if I am dealing with a perturbed FLRW universe, but I am keeping the same co-moving coordinates as before, I didn't change the coordinate system, then the, uh, the fluid elements are no longer on constant x trajectories. Okay, so their trajectories will depart from constant x simply because the universe is no longer homogeneous and isotropic. So I have to allow for these departures from uh, individual fixed co-moving positions and these departures will show themselves as velocities, okay, as peculiar velocities. So there will be a peculiar velocity for dark matter, which is V dark matter and a similar thing for the baryons. All right, so this is the setup and now these are the variables we need to track. Phi, Psi, Theta, Delta dark matter, V dark matter, Delta baryons, V baryons, okay? And among these, we have Phi and Psi and Theta are obviously scalar quantities. Delta dark matter and Delta baryons are scalars. V and V dark matter and V baryons are vectors, but we will see very soon that uh, under the assumptions we are working with, these vectors will be gradients of scalars. Uh, which is a safe assumption and therefore actually you're still talking about two scalar quantities here effectively. Okay, so this is the idea here. And uh, in subsequent slides now, what I will end up doing is to basically write down the Einstein equations and the, and the fluid equations or the Boltzmann equation. I will show you uh, in detail what I'm going to do. Uh, and I will assume that all of these perturbations are small. So even though the inherent equations are nonlinear, I will linearize them by only retaining linear terms in wherever these perturbation variables arise. Okay, so if I see a term that looks like V dot V, I will simply throw it away. Similarly, if I see a term that looks like delta times V, I will throw it away and so on. Okay, I will only keep terms which appear linearly in each of these variables. So when I have a system of linear differential equations, even if they are partial differential equations, it makes a lot of sense to go to Fourier space because at least the spatial dependence becomes very simple. Wherever I have spatial derivatives, I will end up getting algebraic multiplications with powers of k. Okay, so that's why Fourier techniques are extremely useful here. Yes. You can call it convenience uh, simply because uh, we, we know from looking at the CMB that the perturbations in the CMB are very small. They are at the level of 1 power in 10 to, the, 10 to the 5. So 10 to the minus 5 is a safely small number. That square of 10 to the minus 5 can be ignored. Okay, so at least to begin with, we can assume this. The most important way, uh, topic that we will discuss today is what happens when this assumption breaks down. Okay, so this will be non-linear growth, which is part of the lecture. Okay, so this is my Fourier convention. Uh, it's a standard Fourier convention. And for simplicity, just so I don't have to write these powers of 2 pi cubed, etc., I've just invented some notation here. This integral with a subscript k refers to this full integral here. Okay? All right. So in addition to this... I so see. Yes. There are some questions in zone. Do you take them now or later? Uh, let me have them. Yeah. Sure. So one is the but interaction of dark matter with the space time, I suppose gravity. And that the, will be treated very soon, yes. Okay, and the other is uh, asking to repeat the origin of peculiar velocity. The origin of peculiar velocity is at this stage just a conceptual point which says that in the homogeneous and isotropic FLRW universe, if I have a fluid which is homogeneous and isotropic, the elements of that fluid will hold their x coordinates constant. If my, if my coordinate system does not change, but now I am talking about an inhomogeneous universe with a perturbed FLRW metric, then x will no longer remain constant for the same fluid element. It will respond to what the inhomogeneities are doing. So I have to allow for this response and that response becomes a velocity because I have motion and that is what these velocities are tracking. Okay. All right. So I already mentioned this. Uh, what I want to do is to follow the evolution of determined by the Boltzmann equation. So this is Louville's theorem applied to these uh, species which involve the baryons, the dark matter and the photons. And I have Einstein's equations which tell me how the metric uh, evolves. Okay, I will work in Fourier space because I will linearize everything. And I will also define this over dot as a time derivative with respect to conformal time. And then there is this interesting quantity mu because uh, now we are in Fourier space. Okay, so spatial derivatives are going to appear, gradients will appear. 
in Fourier space, gradients become, power, become dot products with the vector k. Okay, so my hats represent unit vectors along the appropriate vector. Okay, so k hat is the unit vector along the vector k. I now have two interesting vectors in the problem. One is the vector k, which tells me about spatial gradients. Okay, how is the density changing as a function of space? Imagine a wave in density, which is, uh, which is spatially looking like this. On top of this changing density, I have a photon which is going in that direction, let's say. Okay, so the density is changing like this, but my photon is going there. So now I have two interesting directions in the problem, the direction of the photon's momentum and the direction of the, of the variation in space. So it is a useful thing to define this, uh, course, uh, this dot product between these two directions. It appears very naturally in the equations. Okay, so I just wanted to write it down here so that when it appears, it does not become very confusing. Okay, and then uh, for similar reasons, it is also interesting to take the moments of the temperature fluctuation averaged over the photon momentum. So remember the temperature fluctuation depends not only on space and time, but it also depends on the photon momentum. And it turns out to be useful to integrate over the photon momenta in different ways in terms of these moments. Uh, and the first, uh, the zeroth and the first moment in particular are very interesting for us. Okay, so the zeroth moment is nothing but the average of the, of the temperature fluctuation over all photon directions. And the dipole moment is defined here in terms of this p dot k quantity. Okay, so these two quantities will become interesting. Fine. Now there is this idea of irrotational flow, which is again an excellent assumption in linear theory because typically during inflation there are no sources of irrotationality. Okay, or there are no sources of vorticity as it is called. So it is very safe to, and basically the rule in gravity is that if there is no source, then that particular quantity decays away as some power of the scale factor. So you can actually do an exercise and ask if I track the evolution of the curl of V, okay, what would it look like? What would its equation be? And it will turn out that the curl of all of these velocities will decay away like one over the scale factor in the absence of any non-standard sources in the early universe. Some kinds of sources may create uh, vorticity in the early universes like primordial magnetic fields, etc. but we will not worry about those. Okay, so it is a safe assumption to say that the velocities have no curl, so they can be written as gradients of scalars. And this is just some convention set up here to write down these velocity vectors in k-space in terms of gradients of scalars. Again, gradients in, uh, in k-space become scalars times something that has the direction of the k-vector, okay, because the gradient becomes the k-vector, and that's kind of written down here. So this is again still the setup. And finally, what are the equations that we are going to track? So I'm not going to deal with neutrinos here. So these uh, components that I talked about are the only components we will track. For the photons, which are described by the, the fluctuation in the temperature, I will use the photon Boltzmann equation. Okay, so the Lewis theorem applied to photons with all collision terms put in. Okay, so photons will talk to electrons through uh, Compton scattering. And these terms have to be put in. There will also be some kind of Compton scattering with, uh, with protons, but because of the proton mass being very large, that will be negligible. Okay, so I have to track that. Then for the dark matter and the baryons, there is a neat trick that you can do. You also have to solve the Boltzmann equation again, but it makes more sense for these two to integrate the Boltzmann equation with respect to the respective momenta. Okay, so you take moments of the Boltzmann equations and you get what is called the continuity equation, which uh, tells you how mass is conserved, and you get the Euler equation, which tells you how momentum is conserved. Okay, so the zeroth moment of the Boltzmann equation gives you the continuity equation, then you multiply by one power of momentum and take another integral over all momenta, you get the Euler equation. Okay, so you can write these things down separately for dark matter and for baryons, yes? Yes. Good. Very good point. So not necessarily because uh, I am working in linear perturbation theory. So I could simply declare that the second uh, moments are small. I don't actually have to assume that uh, that my fluid is cold. So assuming low velocity dispersion. 
Exactly, exactly. The velocity dispersion is order order epsilon squared if epsilon is a small parameter and I'm tracking all terms up to order epsilon. Okay, so I don't have to assume the cold limit, but it's a very good point. For the dark matter, even at late times, I can assume the cold limit uh, and that has interesting consequences. Maybe I'll get to talk about them. And then finally, I have the Einstein equations, which also I have to linearize. Okay, so now I've talked enough. I'm going to just show you the equations. Ah, yeah? see? Yeah? So there is a question uh, about continuity equation. Yeah? It, uh, asking, it shows cons conservation of what? Mass. Yes. Okay, so here are the equations in full glory taken from uh, Dodelson. Okay, so don't worry about what they look like because I haven't derived them for you. If you're going to be in this field, if you're not going to be in this field, you're just here to get a feel for what cosmology looks like, stare at them and enjoy them. If you are going to be in this field, uh, you should go to Dodelson and go through the chapters which derive these equations, okay? Because the derivation is very illuminating. It tells you a lot about the underlying physics, okay? Which unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to do. What I will do is I will, in the next few slides, just show you with red highlighting some interesting features of these equations. The equations will stay here, so take your time to look at them and try to follow what I'm saying uh, and, and see if it makes sense. So let's first talk about the, the connection between baryons and photons, baryon-photon coupling. Why is this important? It is important because it leads to acoustic oscillations which create the, the pattern of fluctuations that you see in the cosmic microwave background. And it also leads to what are called baryon acoustic oscillations in the distribution of galaxies later. So very important observational probes and they come from this physics that is incorporated here. So this coupling is captured by these two terms that are underlined here. This tau that is written down here is what is called the photo, is the electron scattering optical depth. So remember electrons and photons talk to each other through Compton scattering. Okay, and there is a quantity which is called the optical depth, which is like the, you know, it is, it, it is related to the mean free path of these, uh, of these species. How long will it take before the next scattering occurs? Okay, this is roughly the question one asks. And uh, this quantity tau dot comes and couples the equations for the photons, right, which is this equation, with the equations for the momenta of the baryons, which is the Euler equation for the baryons, which is this one here. Okay, so think about what this is telling you. If tau dot is very large, then gravity, which is captured here in the metric potential, does not really play a role when you want to talk about photons and baryons. And it's really photons and baryons doing their own thing in the limit of very strong coupling. As the universe evolves and becomes colder, the quantity tau dot, which depends on the free electron number density times the Thomson's scattering cross section times the scale factor, the free electron number density is what? It is counting how many free electrons there are. As hydrogen starts forming, the number density of free electrons falls. At some point, Saha's equation, for example, will tell you that the free electron number density will start falling exponentially because all of the electrons get trapped in hydrogen atoms. So this tau dot around the time of last scattering will precipitously fall and this coupling will go away. Okay. And look what happens when this coupling goes away. If I throw away this term from the momentum equation for uh, baryons, then this momentum equation looks identical to the momentum equation for dark matter. Okay? And the continuity equation for baryons anyway looks identical to the continuity equation for dark matter. So once the coupling goes away, baryons and dark matter behave identically in terms of their evolution with a critical difference which is that the initial conditions at the time of last scattering will be different, right? Because the dark matter has never been talking to photons, whereas the baryons were constantly in contact with the photons until last scattering. So the specific structure of densities and velocities of baryons at last scattering will be different from the dark matter, uh, will be different from the structure of dark matter at last scattering. So these small differences in initial conditions of the baryons and uh, dark matter at large scattering are quite interesting for structure formation. Okay, and I will not say much more about this later. All right, the next interesting thing is gravitational coupling, which is the primary quantity of interest to understand the growth of structure. And this you can easily see, all the equations have the presence of the metric potentials. 
Okay, the way the equations are structured is that they are written as differential equations for the corresponding quantity. So the photon equation is a differential equation for theta. Then these two are equations for delta and V. These are equations for delta B and VB. Uh, and here there is an equation which doesn't have uh, time, in, uh, time derivatives. But here there is a, the, something that looks like an evolution equation for psi. Okay, so in terms of this language, the metric potentials couple to everything, which is Einstein's uh, remarkable insight that gravity universally couples to everything in the universe, all matter, right? It couples to ordinary matter, to dark matter, and it couples to photons, okay? So that's, that's very important. And similarly, the equation for the evolution of uh, the metric potentials, of course, is the Einstein equation, which depends on the energy density on the right-hand side, okay? Now there's another interesting thing which you have seen once before at least in Marco's lectures which is that the expansion of the universe also plays a role here. Because if you look at these evolution equations for the velocities of baryons and dark matter, if I did not have the expansion of the universe, these things would look like something which gives you exponential growth. Okay, but the presence of the expansion of the universe acts like a damping term here. It acts like friction. So it tempers the growth of structure. And it tempers it in different ways in different epochs. Because the, uh, the epoch that you're talking about, whether you're in the radiation domination or the matter dominated epoch, changes the way the Hubble parameter appears here. I mean, changes the evolution of the Hubble parameter. Okay, and this has uh, remarkable consequences during radiation domination and matter domination, which we will see in the next slides. Finally, there is this interplay of length scales that I was talking about in the very first slide. Okay, so modes being outside the Hubble radius versus inside the Hubble radius. What does it mean for a mode to be outside the Hubble radius? Its lambda, which is its wavelength, has to be larger than h, h inverse. Okay, so 1 over lambda has to be less than 1 over h. So k, which is 1 over lambda, has to be less than uh, less than h. I think I said something wrong. Lambda has to be bigger than 1 over h. 1 over lambda has to be less than h. So k has to be less than h. And if you go through the algebra a little bit carefully, you'll realize that there I was talking about proper or physical length scales lambda. Here I'm talking about co-moving wave numbers k. So the quantity which I should compare k with is not the physical h it is the co-moving H or the conformal H. Okay, so just track the powers of A appropriately. So now what I have to ask is, you know, in all these equations, I see that there are powers of K. Look at this one, for example. There's a power of K here. There is a corresponding power of H here. So when K is much bigger than H, uh, this term will dominate. Sorry, this one will dominate. When K is much less than H, the other one will dominate. And similar things will happen in all the other equations. Okay, so now I will not have time to go through the details of solving these equations, which is done very nicely in Dodelson's treatment. So I encourage you to go and look at that. But I will just point out that there are these issues with uh, relative length scales being uh, outside or inside the Hubble radius. Yeah? So here we are assuming Yes, so the question is that here we are assuming that dark matter never talks to photons. That is exactly correct. I am assuming that this is completely collisionless dark matter. If you want to study a model, a specific model of dark matter in which there are some kind of interactions, you would have to include terms that look similar to these terms. There would be a scattering uh, cross-section and an optical depth for those, uh, for those interactions. You will have to include them here and uh, ask what the signatures will be. Yes, and then you can look for such signatures. People do that. Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah? What is the motivation for making it cold, cold and why is it cold and I, Yes, I gave, this, uh, I gave this argument in one of my earlier lectures. The CMB temperature fluctuations are 10 to the minus 5. Today, we see, so on the scales of 100 co-moving megaparsecs, at the same co-moving length scales today, we see order unity fluctuations. That means a growth of 10 to the plus 5, starting from the CMB epoch. If I have only linear and quasi-linear growth, we will see that the amount of evolution that you can expect is about 10 to the 3, at most 10 to the 4. So there is at least a factor of 10 and maybe a factor 100 discrepancy 
in uh, starting from baryons as your perturbative, uh, you know, perturbative density and growing those baryonic modes into the large scale structure that you see today. So if you want to explain this discrepancy, there must have been a component of uh, non-relativistic matter at the last scattering surface, which was not talking to photons. Because if it was talking to photons, it would have been behaving in like the baryons. It would have had acoustic oscillations. And the CMB tells us that then its perturbations would have been 10 to the minus 5. It doesn't matter. The growth uh, would still be of this order. No, no, it's 10 to the minus 5. No, if it interacts with itself, it is still not uh, talking to photons. No? As long as you don't talk to photons, I don't care what you do. That's what I mean by collisionless. Yeah? Okay. Yes, maybe it's a nomenclature issue. What I mean is it doesn't talk to photons. Okay. Good. So let me show you now, stolen from Dodelson, uh, the solutions for the metric potential. Okay. Uh, uh, for chosen for different values of k. So remember these equations come with k sitting as a parameter. Right? So I can solve these equations for each value of k that I'm interested in. Right? I have some initial conditions which come from inflation for that value of k. I evolve them using these equations and I ask what happens. For this particular example, what uh, Dodelson did is to switch off the collisions between, uh, between baryons and photons. So he just set this tau dot to zero by hand, just for illustration purposes. You can put them back and uh, more complicated things will happen. But this is enough to show you a very important aspect of the growth of structure. So look at uh, how this thing is organized. There are different values of k. And what is plotted is the solution for the mode of phi corresponding to that value of k. Okay, so there are three values of k chosen and there are three solutions shown here. The smallest value of k corresponds to uh, very long wavelength modes. The largest value of k corresponds to very short wavelength modes. The way these modes are chosen is that the longest value of k enters the Hubble radius deep inside matter domination. So the way Dodelson has made this plot is to say that the curve is a solid line until the mode enters the Hubble radius, and after that it becomes a dashed line. Okay, so this mode entered the Hubble radius here, well after matter radiation equality, which is this vertical line here. And then this mode has already entered the Hubble radius substantially before the matter radiation equality, therefore deep in the radiation dominated epoch. And you can clearly see there is a dramatic difference between the way this potential at the long wavelength evolves and the way the short wavelength evolves. Okay, the short wavelength one, as soon as it enters the Hubble radius, it starts decaying very rapidly. And then it comes and it starts oscillating for a while, and then it flattens out. Okay? There is another mode here, which is somewhere in between. It has also entered somewhere during the radiation dominated epoch, but later than this one. And this one also, after it enters, it decays. But it didn't decay by as much as the previous one. Okay, it decayed. It also oscillated a little bit, and then it flattened out again. And, the, and the, the value to which it flattened out is larger than this one. Okay, So you can see that there is a hierarchy set up in the amplitudes of these modes, depending on when exactly they entered the Hubble radius. And all of this follows from solving these equations and uh, following the interplay between the value of k and the evolving value of script h. Yeah. So depending on what happens here, the oscillations that you see and the damping that you see is of a different nature. So now, if I look at all of these modes at a substantially late epoch, close to A equals 1, which is the current epoch, look at what has happened here. The amplitude of this mode is much larger than the amplitude of this mode. Okay? And you can analytically show, again Dodelson has this calculation, that the relative amplitude between this mode and this mode, this is called the transfer function. So if I take a mode which is very small in K versus very large in K, the relative amplitude is given by this analytical asymptotic function. K to the minus 2 multiplied by some uh, weakly increasing factor in k, logarithmic. So you can forget about the logarithmic part. I just kept it for accuracy. But this k to the minus 2 is telling you that uh, you know, the amplitude here is larger than this amplitude by a power of uh, k squared. 
or so, okay, or k to the minus two. So this one is a larger k, and therefore it has a smaller amplitude. This has a very interesting consequence for what is called the matter power spectrum, okay, which is what we will do now, and it, is, uh, one, it has been one of the primary observational probes in the 80s in order to study uh, the lambda CDM or, or uh, any dark matter dominated universe. So let's go through this argument. So at late times, all of these relevant modes that we care about will become sub-Hubble. Because as I told you, you know, at early times, the short wavelength modes will enter the Hubble radius. And as time goes on, longer and longer wavelength modes will enter the Hubble radius. So if you wait long enough until current epoch, there's a huge range of modes all the way out to very long wavelengths, which are all less than the Hubble radius. The Hubble radius today is 3000 megaparsecs. Okay, so uh, any wavelength which is smaller than this is a sub-horizon mode. So for example, 100 MPC modes are sub-horizon today. Okay, so even though they are very long wavelengths. Good. So at these sub-Hubble modes, for these sub-Hubble modes, if I look at the, if I look at this last equation, sub-Hubble means K is much more important than H. And it is also much more important than derivatives with respect to conformal time because d by d eta I can think of roughly order of magnitude as a power of h. So in this last equation I can throw away the time derivative term and this h squared term and I just have k squared psi equal to the right hand side. On the right hand side I am deep in the matter dominated epoch so anything to do with radiation I can safely throw away. And I already told you that uh, this is uh, well after the CMB epoch. So the baryons and the dark matter are doing the same thing. So this whole thing here just becomes one common delta for the total matter. Okay, because the fluctuations are just following each other. So this equation becomes very simple. Can you tell me the name of this equation in this limit? Poisson. It's the Poisson equation. Okay, it's just Laplacian of psi equal to delta, rho bar times delta. So the Poisson equation tells you that delta is like k squared times the gravitational potential phi. So the power spectrum of delta, which is like delta squared, will be k to the power 4, just from here, times the power spectrum of phi. So here I have just separated this k to the 4 into this convenient way of writing things. So k times k cube p phi. k cube p phi is a dimensionless power per unit logarithmic interval in k space. Okay, this is the quantity which in inflation we know is almost scale invariant up to some uh, weak tilt. So this quantity, if it is constant, then the primordial power spectrum for matter behaves like one power of k. If this quantity has a tilt, then uh, the power of k will slightly change. Okay? So now if I look at uh, these modes here, they are very, very long wavelength modes which are tracking the primordial behavior in terms of, because there's not much has happened to them uh, during their evolution. They were mostly frozen for a long time. Okay, so relative to these long wavelength modes, which have a power spectrum that behaves like K, what has happened to the short wavelength modes, which large K? All I have to do is square this quantity here. Okay, because this tells you the relative amplitude between these modes, which are in K to the three halves times phi. So k cube times phi squared will have a relative amplitude, which is the square of this quantity here. The square of this quantity is k to the minus 4 times log squared. And therefore, relative to the k, I will have a k to the minus 3 times log squared. Okay. So what is this saying? At small values of k, the matter power spectrum increases like k. At large values of k, because of what happened during radiation domination, the matter power spectrum decreases like k to the minus 3 times a log squared. Okay, and that is what is shown. Uh, okay, so let me skip this part. That is what is shown here. There is this characteristic turnover from a linearly increasing power spectrum to a cubically, almost cubically decreasing power spectrum uh, because of the nature of uh, modes that enter during radiation and matter domination. Okay, and the place at which this turnaround happens, not surprisingly, is related to the scale which entered the Hubble radius at the time of matter radiation equality. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to argue that it is obvious from looking at this plot. This is the amplitude of phi for short for long wavelength modes that is small k and short wavelength modes that are large k. 
Okay, this amplitude is larger than this amplitude. So this is the amplitude in k three halves times phi. So this quantity k cube p phi is the square of this, right? If I ask for the relative change between this mode and this mode, and I ask for the square of this, I have to square this relative amplitude, which is k to the minus four times log k squared. Okay, it's this this factor squared. So this mode has an amplitude which is smaller than this mode by this factor. So in terms of power, which is like the square of the y-axis, the power at this mode in phi is less than the is so power at this mode is less than the one here by the square of this amplitude, and that is what appears here. And then it gets multiplied by a k because of the Poisson equation. So if I look at the power spectrum of delta and I ask what is the relative power in uh, small k modes and large k modes, the relative behavior. Uh, as a function of k, I get a power of k at small k, and I get k to the minus three at large k. So by continuity, somewhere in the middle, they must have joined, and that joining must have happened around the scale which entered during radiation matter equality. I have half an hour. Okay. All right. So uh, this is what happens, for example, again stolen from Dodelson in a universe which has so. The key thing in this plot is that the scale of which entered during matter radiation equality, you can work this out. Because what is this scale? This is a scale where k is equal to h, but h follows from the Friedman equation. Okay, so h is just h squared is just rho matter plus rho radiation plus uh, rho lambda. Rho lambda is completely irrelevant at those times. And you are demanding that matter and radiation are equal. So rho matter is equal to rho radiation. You can use this condition to solve for the scale factor corresponding to the matter radiation equality epoch. It will depend on the values of omega matter zero and omega radiation zero. Okay, so the parameters omega m zero and omega r zero are are intimately linked with the location of this uh, peak. So if you could measure the location of this peak, you would directly get an estimate of omega matter. Okay, this was the this was one of the things that people were after during the 80s and 90s, and what is shown here theoretically is what happens in a uh, Einstein Dissiter universe with uh, with a particular value for the Hubble constant. It was called standard CDM SCDM, and a lambda CDM universe with omega matter equals 0.3. So you can see that the location of the peak has uh, substantially changed. Okay, and one of the evidences that you don't live in a non-lambda universe. Came from studying the power spectrum of the of the CFH survey, I think, in the early 90s, which already indicated that you have not seen this turnover in the matter power spectrum. Okay, so there was data which kept increasing. So if the data has kept increasing, you have not seen the turnover, which means the turnover is at even larger scales. Which means you could rule out that you lived in an omega matter equals one universe where the turnover would have happened at this scale, and there was data at this scale where there is no turnover. Okay, so there is an interesting discussion about uh, who in, who discovered uh, the fact that uh, we don't live in a standard universe first. Was it the large scale structure people or was it the supernova people? Okay, and there's an interesting uh, discussion because these things were happening around the same time. Okay. So this is what I wanted to say about linear evolution. Are there any questions at this stage? Uh, if not, I want to move on to non-linear growth. Over Zoom, okay. I'll take one from here and then maybe over Zoom. Yeah. Uh, how can we work out the omegas from the peak? How can you work out the omegas from the location of this peak? So what one? So you should do this as an exercise. Calculate the value of k equality. Okay, k equality is defined to be the value of k for the scale which entered the Hubble radius at the time of matter radiation equality. When you evaluate this quantity, you will see that there is a very specific dependence on the value of omega matter zero, omega m zero, and also omega r zero. There's a ratio of them which appears. Omega r zero, you know, because the CMB temperature is very well known. Okay, 2.725 Kelvin will give you omega r zero. I've shown this in some slide long ago. So you take that value. Hubble parameter maybe you don't know. Okay, so you can leave that in. So then there will be a combination of omega m zero and the Hubble parameter, which will completely determine the value of k equality. 
So now you go and say, I have measured the value of K equality and it turns out to be 70 MPC inverse. Okay, 70 MPC the whole inverse, let's say. From that, you can then try to infer the value of omega M0 times this uh, particular, uh, you know, uh, power of H that will appear. So that's how one plays this game. Okay. Anything from Zoom? Okay. Great. So let's move on. Uh, this is all very nice. And actually, it's a very beautiful theory. It Sorry, is... just now there is a question. Okay, up okay, here. no problem. What does the linear power spectrum represent physically? Okay, so what is happening is, I mean, the physics is all comprised in the, in the evolution here, right? So the power spectrum is a statistical probe, but what it is doing is it is combining information about the evolution of different modes together with the knowledge of the initial conditions. So different parts of the power spectrum probe different physics. Okay, so the low K part of the power spectrum directly probes primordial structure. The high K part probes what happened during radiation domination. The, uh, the peak probes the background cosmology, as I just argued. There is something that is crucially missing because we switched off baryons or Dodelson switched off baryons when producing this plot. If you had switched them on, you would see that on top of this smooth looking uh, function here, there would be oscillations. And those would be what are called baryon acoustic oscillations. Okay, so that part of the power spectrum would probe the interaction between baryons and photons. So these are the different physical quantities that are being probed by the power spectrum. All right, yeah? In early cosmology, I think one is uh, given the assumptions and given what we know from BBN and the CMB, I think it is quite safe to apply the Lewell equations because uh, you are talking about a plasma, uh, which is all pervading. So, uh, you know, you are actually talking about microscopic entities, which are electrons and protons interacting with photons, and you are describing them in a macroscopic sense for the, uh, for the baryons and dark matter, and then in, a, in the microscopic sense for the... Uh, for the photons. But at late times, this is an interesting question which I had briefly discussed in an earlier lecture. So maybe you can follow what I said there instead of, uh, uh, instead of talking here. Because when there are galaxies in the universe, you can ask this question. Is the Lewell approach actually valid or not? Okay, because... Like or yes, yes, yes. Exactly. I see. Yeah. Can you repeat the answer to what question this was? Uh, it was a question, I think, I don't remember whether there was a question, but I had a comment related to whether or not the fluid approximation works at uh, late times when there are only galaxies which you are tracking. Okay, if the cosmic web is made of galaxies, then uh, you want me to repeat the question here. At what point, uh, is there a point at which the Lewell equation or the Lewell treatment fails? Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. Let me catch me during the discussion. This will take me far away from what I want to discuss here. Yeah. Yeah. What time is this calculated? What time is this calculated at? This is calculated at redshift zero. I will immediately immediately talk about evolution uh, of these of these modes. Yes. This oscillation in the evolution of density. Which oscillation are you talking about? Baryon acoustic, okay, what are baryon acoustic oscillations? Basically, if I imagine ramping up the value of uh, tau dot, so forget about gravity. I will have sound waves which will propagate in this fluid. These are uh, oscillations in the sound, in the, in the fluid. Now I take a snapshot of the fluid at the last scattering surface. So whatever the modes were doing, Right? So a particular mode, if it was in a rarefaction phase, it will be frozen there. If it was in a contract or whatever, rarefaction phase, which was, and then contraction will be frozen somewhere else. So if my initial conditions had set up coherent modes, which they do for adiabatic initial conditions, uh, then uh, these contractions and rarefactions would appear coherently at the time of the snapshot. And that is exactly what you see in the CMB power spectrum, which will be discussed next week. Okay? It is not, uh, it isn't, okay, is it evolution on one time slice? It is not evolution, it is a snapshot 
of what has happened until then. Different modes are coherently evolving uh, starting from the initial conditions. Okay, so if uh, a particular wavelength has become smaller and a particular wavelength has become larger, that imprint is left at the time of last scattering and it is captured there. If my initial conditions were incoherent, such as in the case of isocurvature perturbations or with hot dark matter or something, then uh, I would uh, not have seen these coherent oscillations in the CMB power spectrum. So that places a very tight constraint on the nature of the initial conditions. Okay? I hope the CMB lecture, I, I, I'm pretty sure, they will cover these aspects in more detail. But uh, it's good to also think about them at this stage because this is where they come from. Okay. All right, let me talk about nonlinear growth. What is the time? I cannot see it from here. Is it three? Five to three. Okay, okay, fine. So about uh, 20 minutes left. Yeah? All right. So now let's uh, move beyond linear perturbations. Because uh, what we have seen uh, is that there is going to be some level of growth. Okay, and I have not really focused on that. I want to focus on it now. Uh, but at least we can appreciate that uh, at some point the universe becomes matter dominated. And also the CMB last scattering epoch is far in the past. Okay, so I had already argued for you that uh, during this late time well after last scattering, all of radiation can be thrown away and the baryons and dark matter are basically doing the same thing. So let's uh, look at the equations of interest in this limit. Okay, that's, uh, let's, that's the starting point. So that is written down here. And uh, ask me later because I am also not 100% sure about the phi equal to psi at all wavelengths. Uh, there are certain regimes in which you can safely put phi equal to psi. There are other regimes where it's a little bit of a discussion. So let's discuss this later. But uh, let's assume for the time being that it's a safe assumption to set the two metric potentials equal to each other. At early times, it is actually very safe if you do not have neutrinos because it turns out that the only reason why phi and psi would be different is through the quadrupole moment of the photon distribution uh, perturbation. And this quadrupole moment, you can argue based on Compton scattering, will be driven to zero very rapidly. Okay, so unless there are neutrinos uh, which change the picture, this phi will be equal to psi in the linear regime. Uh, in the nonlinear regime, one needs to discuss a bit for the time being, let's just set them equal. The remaining equations, now uh, I will allow for nonlinear terms. Okay, so pause for a second. Earlier, I had kept all of these equations keeping only linear terms. Now I am going to allow nonlinear terms to appear in the equations. So for this slide, just look at the equations and see which nonlinear terms I have kept. In the next slides, I will also show you which nonlinear terms I have thrown away because they may also be interesting. Okay? So what appears here in the upper equation, it looks like the Poisson equation, but it has a couple of terms which involve uh, psi dot and h squared psi. So this is a relativistic version of the Poisson equation. Okay, it appears because you are not doing Newtonian cosmology, you are studying GR. And GR comes from Einstein's equations and Einstein's equations have these terms in them. So keep them for the time being. Okay? Uh, then there is the continuity equation and the Euler equations. These are the only two equations we need really to track because I only have now a total matter fluctuation field to worry about. So the continuity equation looks very much like the original, the, the usual fluid dynamics continuity. I have a time derivative of density. I have a divergence of rho times velocity. Okay? The relativistic aspect comes because the right hand side has a psi dot. So if I am worried about uh, long wavelengths, I would have to worry about this psi dot. The Euler equation again looks very much like the fluid dynamics Euler equation. I have a v dot, I have a v dot grad v, the advective term. It is sourced by the gradient of a gravitational potential just as it is in Newtonian gravity. And the expanding nature of the universe appears in the presence of this H here, given that we are working with conformal time. Okay? So these are the equations we want to think about. Yes? Uh, can we uh, find the right hand side of the second equation? I cannot actually hear you. By what? By intuition, can, can we? Uh, by intuition, I don't have. Okay, can we find the right hand side of the second equation? By intuition, I do not know. I do not have the intuition to derive the three times psi dot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So is it a physical wave or Is this a physical what? Velocity or velocity? 
this is, is it a physical velocity or a co-moving velocity? It is the co-moving velocity in the sense that it tells you the, for a fluid element, see this is the Eulerian picture, uh, in which, uh, okay, this is the Eulerian picture, it is not the Lagrangian picture. So it is telling you how the fluid is moving on the original coordinate system. So in the original coordinate system, a homogeneous fluid would not move. It would simply sit there. Its temperature might change, but it's just sitting there. In the presence of perturbations, this fluid will move around a little bit. Okay, this is the velocity captured here. Dodelson will cleanly define this for you also in terms of the energy momentum tensor and the distribution function of the individual species. So just follow it up there. Yeah. All right. So now I want to study these equations in a certain limit because this is the limit of interest for me. Yeah? Uh, uh, I will introduce a new variable which is the divergence of velocity simply because I want to assume irrotational flow. So uh, the velocity field does not have a curl. So the only relevant degree of freedom is anyway a scalar component. So I might as well call it the divergence of the velocity field. Okay, divergence is a good enough uh, variable to track, assuming a rotational flow. I will also assume that I am deep in the sub-horizon, sub-Hubble limit. So at small scales, because that's where I am interested in studying the growth of structure. In this limit, I can safely throw away these terms. These were the relativistic contributions which might have become important at large scales. Now I'm at small scales, so I'm basically in the Newtonian limit. Okay, so I really don't have to think too much. I could, I could have just written down the Poisson equation itself, but I showed you these terms to know the, what you're throwing away. Okay, in this, as a, in this uh, limit, the equations that you see remaining here, okay, so the continuity equation is delta dot plus divergence of this quantity equal to zero. The Euler equation is this differential operator plus a uh, advective term equal to negative gradient of psi and Laplacian of psi is delta. Okay, so it's a non-linear coupled set of equations. This can be manipulated okay, by doing some uh, clever transformations, introducing the divergence of V and working in Fourier space. And the result is what is written down here. Okay, so uh, this is a calculation that you have to do. Yeah, so there is no physics involved here, it's simply algebra. The physics is all contained here. I have just rewritten things in Fourier space. And I have chosen to write things so that on the left hand side, you only have terms that appear linearly. And all the nonlinearity in these equations is dumped on the right hand side. Okay, so here, for example, I have nonlinear terms, which is delta times V appearing inside the divergence. Here I have a V and another V here. This is the nonlinear term. These are the only nonlinear terms actually in these equations. There are no other nonlinear terms if you look at them. Okay. So all I have done is take these two nonlinear terms and place them on the right hand side of the equations and move all the other linear terms on the left hand side. So I have written down these equations here. There is an equation for evolution of delta and an equation for the evolution of the divergence of velocity. This replaces the continuity and the Euler equations in Fourier space. Okay, and there is some convention here which is which is written down, doesn't really matter. So what you can again appreciate is that the nonlinearity of these equations is exactly quadratic. There is a theta times delta and a delta and a theta times theta, and there are no theta cubed or theta delta squared, any such term. This is the nature of Newtonian gravity or GR at small scales. Okay, this is naturally appearing here. There are no further approximations here. Okay. So in the next couple of slides, I will discuss some aspects of these equations and further mathematical uh, details you can explore in the two homework assignments that I will give you immediately after the lecture. Okay, so I will discuss some of the conceptual issues related to each of these homework assignments. The first assignment deals with the linear version of these equations. So what we were already talking about, but in this limit of sub-horizon evolution. And the second talks about second order perturbations. Okay, so these are the two things I will discuss next. So in the next slides, what will happen is that all the text that you see here, it will move and it will sit on one corner of the page. And then I will talk about some other stuff. Okay, so don't be worried about too much text coming. Most of it is the same. Okay, so here we go. The only addition here is that I have also shown you the terms that I have ignored for those who really want to go into detail and ask what are the assumptions that I made in writing down these equations. Okay, so uh, these kinds of terms have been thrown away uh, and one can discuss them later, but uh, I will not focus on them just now. So let's uh, think about what is written down here. 
So let's, so here I've said recovering because I was supposed to have shown you what it looks like, but we are, we have not shown you. So let's say we want to derive the linear limit of these equations and ask what uh, the density contrast behaves like. So what I will do in the linear limit is throw away nonlinear terms as we have been doing before. So the right hand sides of these equations can be set to zero in the linear limit. Okay, that's the linear assumption. Once I do that, I just have a coupled set of linear differential equations between delta and theta. So I can simplify this set of equations by taking one derivative of the first equation and using the second equation and the first equation to eliminate all appearances of theta. What I'll be left with, because I took a derivative of the first equation, I'll be left with a second order differential equation. Okay, and that equation is written down here. You can easily derive this, there's nothing much to do. This is a second order differential equation. It has two solutions in general. And you can solve this equation in different limits. And for example, in a universe which has omega matter and omega lambda, I can write down the solution. Uh, it turns out that one of the solutions is simply proportional to the usual Hubble parameter, which is a decaying function of time. So this is called the decaying mode. The Hubble parameter, for example, during uh, matter domination goes like one over a to the power three halves, right? Uh, so this is a decaying function. And the other one is actually a growing function. So it's called the growing mode. And uh, the homework exercise makes you prove these two expressions. Okay? It makes you derive this equation and solve it. So this is nice for the following reasons. Look at this equation. You don't see any powers of k anywhere. Yeah? This is a very interesting fact. Because what happened here? Uh, the thing that happened is that when I went to the divergence of velocity, in the linear part of the equations, all powers of k simply vanished. Because the k dependence was always appearing in the linear part only as a divergence of the velocity field. And as a gradient of the potential, but when I take a divergence of the Euler equation, the gradient of the potential becomes a Laplacian of the potential. And the Laplacian of the potential is just the density contrast. So the k dependence goes away from there also. Okay, so this appearance of this h squared delta comes from the Poisson equation actually. So there is no explicit dependence on k here. And therefore there is none here as well. Which means that I don't need to know which k I am talking about in order to solve this equation. All k modes in this limit behave identically. So that power spectrum that I showed you in this limit just keeps changing with time. It does not change its shape in this limit. Once all modes have become sub-Hubble and you are in the deep, uh, you know, well beyond matter radiation equality, all the modes just evolve together. So the power spectrum re re retains its shape and it just keeps changing with time. And uh, the decaying mode of the power spectrum, I mean of the, of, of the solutions will just decay away eventually. So after a sufficient amount of time, the growing mode is the only thing that matters and the power spectrum will just increase like the square of the growing mode. Okay, square because power spectrum is two powers of delta. Yeah? So this is a very simple evolution in the linear regime without changing the shape. Good. Uh, and uh, this is what I have sh done. Uh, I mean, this is what you will see in the, in the exercises as well. Uh, and another interesting thing is that uh, during matter domination, what you can prove again from these equations is that this growth of the growing mode is just proportional to the scale factor. It's a very interesting fact. Okay, it need not have been like this, but the equations organize themselves in such a way that the growing mode during matter domination is just proportional to the scale factor. So this makes life very simple uh, going down the line. So in fact, uh, this particular aspect is very useful in the second exercise where I will ask you to solve uh, the second order perturbation uh, theory results for these equations. Okay, so this is as far as the linear growth is concerned. In general, what you can appreciate from, uh, from these equations is that the generic solutions to these equations will be nonlinear in the initial conditions. Because once I set up the initial conditions, then imagine doing these, uh, solving these equations numerically. Right? So what will I do? I will take whatever I am given at the initial conditions and I will evolve it by one time step using these equations by writing delta dot as delta at t uh, minus delta at, uh, you know, t minus delta t and I divide by a small delta t. So the initial conditions will appear then in the source terms here at that first time step. 
and they already appear non-linearly. They appear multiplied by each other. So the generic solutions at late time will be non-linear in the initial conditions. Okay, so you will have to do some kind of now, you have to deal with this in some way. How do you solve this? So one approach could be to say that if the initial conditions describe small perturbations, then let's imagine a Taylor series in the initial conditions. I will look at terms which are quadratic in the initial conditions, then uh, for third power in the initial conditions if they exist, fourth power in the initial conditions, and I will treat them separately. Okay, and your exercise two will exactly do this, and it will retain terms of the up to the lowest non-vanishing order beyond the linear theory. But now, if I have something which is non-linear in the initial conditions, it is also easy to see that I will naturally produce something like a three-point function. Okay, because non-linearity in the initial conditions means that even if the initial conditions are perfectly Gaussian and do not have any three-point function of their own. I will have products of them appearing in the solution at later times. So when I take three point correlators of the late time field, I will naturally have non-zero three point functions. Okay, because the initial conditions appear non-linearly. So the late time field is non-Gaussian, even if the initial conditions are perfectly Gaussian. Okay, so even if inflation, you know, inflation tells us that the initial conditions, the simplest models, will say that the initial conditions are almost Gaussian. I am saying even if the initial conditions are exactly Gaussian, gravitational growth will naturally produce non-Gaussianity. This is very important because if I want to constrain models of inflation by looking for signatures of primordial non-Gaussianity through large scale structure, I have to worry about the fact that gravitational evolution produces its own non-Gaussianity. So I cannot simply measure the non-Gaussianity of a galaxy distribution and say that I have discovered uh, some complicated model of inflation. Okay, what I may have discovered is just gravitational evolution. Okay, so I have to worry about this. Good, that is one aspect. There is another very important aspect of these equations which is hidden in these very glib, glib looking integrals over k. These integrals over k are over all of k space formally. Okay, so now I have to ask the question, does this even make sense? In what limit do these equations make sense? One of the assumptions, key assumptions that I made while, uh, while uh, writing down the equations related to an earlier question about the truncation of the hierarchy of the Boltzmann functions. So again, I have truncated at uh, second order in this hierarchy of moments of the Boltzmann function. And this, is, this can be a problem at late times where something called multi-streaming happens in phase space. So basically in phase space, volume elements start crisscrossing and uh, even if the initial conditions for dark matter are perfectly cold, the dark matter sheet which is defined by these cold initial conditions can wrap around itself. Okay, so if you're not uh, following what I'm saying, ask me in the discussion session. So in this time of multi-streaming, when the sheet is wrapping over itself, the second moment of the Boltzmann uh, of the distribution function will be non-zero. And I will not be able to make these assumptions anymore. And uh, all of these equations will actually break down at that point. Okay, I will have caustics forming. Uh, so densities will go to infinity formally. And all of these equations, this fluid picture will break down. So this is a strong assumption in the setting up of these equations. So you could say, okay, I'll just solve the equations until this happens. Different scales may go... Uh, may shell cross or become multi-streamed at different epochs. So for a particular scale of interest, for a particular k, I will work out when that multi-streaming happens and I'll stop my evolution well before then. This would be fine if you're dealing with some kind of linearized evolution, but it's not fine when I have on the right hand side integrals of the same quantities over all k. So these solutions are actually responding to regimes of k space which could easily have shell crossed at some very early time okay small enough scales can shell cross at very early times in a perfectly cold dark matter cosmology so this way of thinking has this inherent problem that i cannot even write these equations without declaring that i do not have power below a certain length scale so this is this issue uh, which leads in, uh, when you think about it further, it leads to approaches such as uh, renormalized perturbation theory and the effective field theory of large scale structure. So there are uh, experts in the audience who you can uh, uh, catch hold of later to have this discussion. Okay, so I guess I'm out of time now. Yes, 
So I will in one slide show you what I'm not talking about uh, at all. And there is another slide uh, which I can safely ignore and take up uh, in tomorrow's lecture because tomorrow's lecture is going to deal with uh, what is called the Zeldovich approximation in great detail. So I'll simply not talk about it here. Uh, the one very important nonlinear approximation uh, which goes beyond uh, this way of doing things perturbatively. So because if I want to discuss the equations that I want to solve and the solutions that I get beyond this idea of perturbation theory, which may or may not work correctly, I have to deal with some level of approximation to my system of equations. Okay, so if my system of equations is the collisionless Boltzmann equation, which does not have any theoretical problems, it is just the equation that I have to solve. Uh, then how do I go about solving it? So there are layers of approximations that you can do. One important approximation is spherical collapse, where I assume that uh, my initial conditions have a very high level of spatial symmetry. They are inhomogeneous, but spherically symmetric. Turns out that this is a very powerful constraint on the evolution of the equations, uh, on the evolution of the, of the fields. And uh, the, uh, the solutions can be written down analytically, and they are actually the same as what you would write down for an FLRW geometry with uh, positive curvature. Okay, or in case of an overdense uh, perturbation. And uh, they are the same as FLRW geometry with negative curvature if you talk about an uh, underdense perturbation. So uh, this mathematics turns out to be identical to FLRW and therefore you can write down the solutions analytically. And they have very nice behavior. They describe, uh, you know, shells which increase with time, their radius increases with time, reaches a maximum. And now, instead of continuing to expand with the rest of the universe, this shell detaches from the expansion and collapses. This is very, very nice, okay, because this is actually what you want. You want things to collapse and grow, right? So I showed you simulations where things were clearly coming together. So spherical collapse is one of the oldest approximations which allows you to do this. Again, more uh, can be discussed later if someone is interested. And the other thing that I have not talked about, which can be discussed in the discussion session, is how one goes beyond all of these approximations and tries to get as accurate a solution to the collisionless Boltzmann equation as you can, given the computational resources that you have. And this goes by the name of n-body simulations of dark matter, where the goal, simply put, is to solve the collisionless Boltzmann equation numerically. Okay, and now how one does it is just a matter of computational physics where I have to cleverly find ways of manipulating this equation so that I don't lose accuracy, uh, but I still maintain you know, my computational budget, etc. So let me not talk about this uh, just now. I will stop and maybe take a few questions before the break. <laughs>